I'm Paul and I'm Head of Chemistry at uh, White Sixth Form College. Now obviously this year due to the COVID-19 situation, unfortunately you won't have been able to join us for White Start at the college. But what we've decided to do in chemistry is normally at White Start we would give you two lessons in chemistry to give you a taste of what lessons are like at the college. So we thought we'd just take one of those lessons and record it for you to take you through to give you a little bit of a flavour of what chemistry might be like if you were to be doing it at the college next year. Um, this lesson also links in with the White Start booklet which you'll also be able to um, download and you'll be expected to complete ready for when you join us at the college. And the last exercise in the booklet is based on today's lesson that we're going to try and run through here. OK, so normally to start with, we give you some practice for some previous work. We might get out the sort of whiteboards and pens and get you to note some things down to find out what you already know. So we'll do the same here. So we'll start with what you know about covalent bonding. So what you should be able to do is through this video, you should be able to pause at certain points, try and answer the question and then start up again. And I'll be going through with the answers. So why don't you pause it now and just make a note. What do you know about covalent bonding? OK, if I'm in the classroom, the common answers that we get are things such as shared electrons. And that's quite right. And that's that's common through AS and into A level that we understand that covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. I also see people who note down their strong bonds. And again, that's important. And we'll build on that during our A level studies. Equally, quite often I see a few people write down that these are bonds between non-metals. And that's one of those things where it's sort of mostly the case. It's kind of what you go through at GCSE, but actually it's a little more complex than that. And that's some of the things you'll learn at A level, not necessarily in this lesson. But it is important that we know that covalent bonding is shared bonding for what we're going to look at in this lesson. OK, so continuing with some more practice this time. I want you to draw me the electron configuration of a nitrogen atom. So you might want to get yourself a periodic table here if you haven't got one to hand. But just in case you aren't able to find one, I can tell you that nitrogen has seven outer electrons. So you can bear that in mind. So again, why don't you pause here, have a go at drawing it and let's see what you come up with. So this is the typical uh, example of what I might see drawn in the classroom. Here we have the nitrogen with the nucleus at the center, and we can see the electrons orbiting it in circles like little planets going around the sun overall. Some people also note down the sort of 2.5 or 2,5 underneath it, showing that we have two electrons in the first energy shell and then five electrons outside that. Again, this is a GCSE type model that we'll build on uh, in a more complex form when you come to do A level at Wyke. It's not important for today to understand that more complex model, so we will stick with the sort of dot cross diagrams that you've been drawing here. So another question to have a go at. Why don't I actually draw me a dot cross diagram for a hydrogen molecule this time? So what would you draw? Again, pause the video at this point, have a go, and then start again when you're ready to continue. So there we have it, two hydrogen atoms, each one has one outer electron and we show them shared forming that covalent bond. And we see we use a dot to show that one of them's come from one hydrogen atom, a cross to show that one's come from the other hydrogen atom. So normally people are doing pretty well on that, so we need to try and make it a little trickier at this point. How about drawing the dot cross diagram for a water molecule overall? So again, have a go at that one. Outer electrons only for the oxygen is fine. OK, so let's have a look at what you've drawn. Now, I'm in the classroom. I often look around at the whiteboards at this point and I get some that look like this. Sort of like you've got the oxygen there, the dot showing its six outer electrons across for each of the hydrogen electrons being shared, making those two single covalent bonds with the hydrogens kind of at right angles to each other. Some people draw it in this form, so this time you've know, still got the six outer electrons from the oxygen, the shared electrons with the hydrogens, but everything drawn in a straight line in this case. And then I get some like this one, it's the same with all the electrons, it looks a bit like Mickey Mouse overall. 
or get some of them a bit higher up, more like a sort of Bugs Bunny type one with the two hydrogen sort of sat on top of the oxygen like that. And I often ask at this point, sort of, which one do you think is the correct one out of these? What might you think? Have a think about that for a minute. OK, occasionally I get someone pointing out that maybe it's the sort of Mickey Mouse one because they might have seen it drawn somewhere. In fact, for the purposes of a dot cross diagram, any of them are fine. But the reason I sort of do this is to say, well, actually, in terms of the actual shape of the water molecule, there is one that is more correct than others. And that's what we're going to try and look at today. So now let's look at what we're going to look at in today's lesson overall. So the intention of this is to try and understand how to work out the shapes of molecules. With the intention being by the end, you'll be able to tell me the correct shape of the molecule and why that is. What are you going to need to be able to do in order to do that? Well, first you need to work out the number of electron pairs around the central atom. And we'll be looking at how to do that and how to count them overall. From that information, you're then able to identify the shape of the molecule. And it's kind of learning the different shapes that are present overall. Then you need to draw a representation of the shape of that molecule and use appropriate nomenclature. So, in other words, be able to draw it and name it overall. And that's a little bit trickier. And so we'll have to work on how to do that. And also identifying and remembering the bond angles in the molecules. You can see here that the overall the shapes topic any individual part of it's not that tricky, which is why I've suggested sort of grade B, C and D level, depending on how far we can go. Really, grade A at the top end is being able to sort of do this perfectly and learn them all and not get them wrong and not make mistakes. So start off, I kind of introduce you to five letters, V, S, E, P, R. What do they stand for? Well, they stand for valence shell electron pair repulsion. And actually, that's not important overall. The main reason I mention it is that in exams, I have seen them sometimes use the letters VSEPR and say use VSEPR theory to work out the shape of this molecule. And all they mean is doing what we've done today. So you need to recognize those letters, but you don't need to understand in depth what they stand for. To have a look at it though, valence shell is just a name given for the outer shell or the outer electrons. So it shows we're talking about the outer electrons. Electrons, because obviously that's what it's to do with. Electron pair, you can notice there. And in fact, electrons tend to pair up in either making a bond or what we call lone pairs. And repulsion, because as we know, electrons are negatively charged, so they will repel each other. And that's the key to giving us the shape. To sum it up quite simply then, electron pairs in a molecule are going to repel each other to try and get as far away as possible. And that's what's going to give us the shape overall. Right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through, we're gonna learn the shapes by sort of working through some different examples that you can kind of note down as we go through. For each one, I'm going to try and complete a bit of a table like this. So we're going to look and work out the total number of electron pairs that are present around the central atom. First thing I said we need to work out. We're going to look at how many of those are involved in bonding and therefore if there are any left over, which gives us what we call our lone pairs. And then we're going to look at what shape that makes overall. So first one we're looking at is beryllium chloride. And to try and work out the number of electron pairs, we start off by doing a dot cross diagram overall. So we start with beryllium at the center, and then you need a periodic table to look up that beryllium is in group two. In other words, it has two outer electrons overall. And there we have them, and we can draw them in two outer electrons on beryllium. Doesn't matter where we draw them overall. And I'm not drawing all the circles in, it's just simply put the electrons on to start with. We can see that the beryllium is attached to two chlorines. So we need to put those on. So that's showing one of the chlorine atoms and a cross is used to show the electron it's sharing with the beryllium. Now I know that chlorine has seven outer electrons, I could draw in the other six if I want, but realistically since the beryllium's at the centre and it's that one we're interested in, to simplify the diagram I'm just going to show the shared pair of electrons there. And similarly, our second chlorine can be drawn sharing its electron. 
And that completes our sort of diagram showing the dots and crosses of the electrons that are present around the beryllium. What this allows me to do is now count the number of pairs. I can see that there's one pair of electrons there that the beryllium is sharing with one of the chlorines and another pair of electrons there that the beryllium is sharing with the other chlorine. And that allows me to fill in the first part of my table. So here we have it. How many electron pairs did we have involved here around the beryllium? We had two, those two electron pairs. How many of those electron pairs were making a bond? Well, both of them were, so therefore that's also two. So did we have any electrons left over to make lone pairs? And the answer is no, so that's zero. In other words, to get the lone pairs, we do the total number of electron pairs and subtract the number of bonding pairs. Two minus two is zero in this case. So now we're going to need to look at the shape overall. Right. Normally at this point, I introduce you to the fact that we're going to try and make some models of these and use that to help you with your learning overall. So if we we're in the class, we provide you with some bits and pieces. I would provide you with one fruit pastel type sweet uh, overall, which is going to represent our central atom. I would provide you with six of these sort of mini marshmallows overall, which we're going to use to represent the attached atoms. And we would have about six of these, I'm going to use cut in half cocktail sticks, which are going to be used to make the bonds or uh, show the electrons essentially that are present overall. If you are able to get hold of any of these sort of uh, bits and pieces or if you've got any sort of like Play-Doh or straws or anything at home you could use, you can have a go at making the models as we go along. So how does this work? Well, we're looking at the beryllium chloride to start with. So I'm going to take my fruit pastel, that's my beryllium. I'm going to take my cocktail stick, which is representing my electrons, and I can insert that in there. And then onto that, I can attach my marshmallow. And that's one of my bond chlorines bonded to it. What I now have is another cocktail stick and marshmallow, the other chlorine, with its pair of electrons. And essentially, I've got to attach these together to keep this as far as possible from this overall. So normally people work out, it's pretty obvious. If I stick that in the opposite side like that, that keeps these two pairs of electrons as far apart as I possibly can. And it's that repulsion that gives us this shape altogether. What we then look at is we look at naming this shape. This shape is called linear because everything is in a straight line. We can draw it all in a straight line and I'll show you that on the next slide. And we can also look at the bond angle which is the angle between the two bonds here which normally most people can tell me fairly obviously is 180 degrees overall. OK, then. So remember, we had two pairs of electrons, two bonding pairs and no lone pairs. And then we made the model and we discovered that our two bonds shown here by straight lines between the beryllium and the chlorine are drawn on opposite sides of the molecule. And we can see there's a 180 degree bond angle between them. And this gives us what we call a linear shape altogether. And that's the first of our shapes. And in fact, anything that we discover that has just two pairs of electrons is going to try and form this linear type shape. So moving on to our next one, we're going to have a go at boron trifluoride. Now, I normally get you in the class to have a go at drawing the dot cross diagram the first bit. And the idea is that we've the first one I've kind of shown you, the next one we kind of work through together. And as we start working through the shapes, you start doing them more and more on your own. So let's have a look at that for a minute. Now. So here we have it, the boron drawn at the center. We look it up on a periodic table. We can discover that boron is in group three. 
So therefore we have three outer electrons drawn, there they are. And now we've got three fluorine atoms to bond to it. Each fluorine atom comes with an electron to make a bond. Second one there, and the third one there. What does that give us then? Well, if we count them up, we have one pair of electrons there, two there, three there. So we have three pairs of electrons involved, all three are involved in bonding, and we have no lone pairs. So that's what we should have drawn for that. So filling in the table, three pairs of electrons, all three making a bond, and no lone pairs present. So let's have a look at the shape then. Well, I get you to have a go at this point. So taking your model, if you've got one available, having to think about it, what might the shape look like? Let's have a look at that. Okay, so typically I'll go around the class at this point and see what they've made. And what I tend to see is that um, I get some people who've made one that looks a bit like that. So simply they've taken our linear one and stuck another one in, keeping it a nice distance apart. But I also see some people who kind of then rearrange them and spread them around a bit like that. So it kind of looks like, yeah, the emblem on the Mercedes badge overall, that sort of shape. And what we can see is that these, in that first one example I had, there was 90 degrees between the bonds. All of these are greater than 90 degrees. So that seems to have worked out. Drawing this is fairly straightforward again. It all lies nice and flat. So we have the boron at the center. We draw a nice single covalent bond to each of the three fluorines. And again, I'll show you that on the next slide. Naming it is interesting. What we can see is that they form a triangle overall, but overall chemists don't seem to use the word triangle. Um, they use the word trigonal overall when we have something triangular shaped. So that's a word you'll need to learn. And also there are other shapes that involve that triangle. The important thing with this one is it lies all flat on my hand there, so it lies flat in one surface. And what might you call that? Well, if it lies on a surface, we say it lies all in one plane, so we call it planar. The name for this shape then is trigonal planar. Equally, we can look at the angles between them, and normally someone's able to tell me, I ask the class and someone says, well, that's 120 degrees. Now I ask them how they work it out. They say well, 360 in a circle, divided by three, because there's three even spacings, giving us the 120. And that's quite useful and also links into, because you might be asked to explain that in an exam, and the key is that we have three equally spaced bonds repelling each other with that equal amount. And you must mention there are three, because other sh shapes have equally repelling bonds, but don't have three, and so therefore don't have a 120 degree bond angle. So that's the key thing for this one. So we'll just put those figures into our table now. So there we have it. This was the shape that overall had three electron pairs. Three of them were involved in bonding and we had no lone pairs present. And then we had a look at it and we said we would draw it with the boron at the centre, the three fluorines in that kind of triangular type shape equally spaced around it, again shown with nice straight lines to represent the covalent bonds. The name of it, there's that trigonal planar there, and the bond angles of 120 degrees. So now we're going to look at methane here, CH4 overall. So I'd hand over to you at this point. Most people are getting the hang of it by now. Have a go at drawing the dot cross diagram and see if you can fill in how many electron pairs there are, how many pairs are involved in bonding, and how many lone pairs are present. So this is the dot cross diagram you should have drawn then. Carbon with its four outer electrons, hydrogens each sharing an electron. You know, if I haven't worked through it this time, you can expect that normally we get in the hang of it by now, so we can go through it a little bit quicker. And we can see quite correctly that by counting them up, you should have worked out that there are four pairs of electrons present, all four are involved in bonding, and there are no lone pairs present. And that equally allows us to fill in our table. Four electron pairs, all four involved in bonding, and no lone pairs present. 
Okay, so over to our models then. So you might want to pause at this point and have a go. What would you now do? How would you make that model to keep the four bonds as far apart as you possibly can? So have a go at that and then we'll come back and we'll see what you have come up with. Now, what I normally discover is that looking around the room, quite a lot of people end up doing that. What they've tried to do is they've obviously shown good understanding of what we're looking at in the sense that they've now got four bonds. They've kept them equally spaced as far apart as possible, as well, so they think overall. And they've got that kind of shape, that kind of cross. But I ask them normally to think about the bond angles there. What they've done is they've created something with four 90 degree bond angles. And that doesn't seem too much of a problem, does it? Let's just have a look for a second what else you could have done. Well, sometimes what I get is I occasionally get some people who know this and I get them making a model that looks a bit more like that one there overall. And I ask, well, is the bond angle there bigger or smaller than 90 degrees? And obviously we can see that it's clearly bigger than 90 degrees. So therefore, are the electrons further apart in this one or the first one I have? And clearly it's this one because they're more than 90 degrees apart. So therefore, which is the better model? Well, this one has them further apart. I normally ask, what does this one do that the previous model didn't? And normally someone can point out that clearly we're using three dimensional space rather than simply just bringing another one in the side and spreading them out. This one's used all the space that was available at the top to bring in a new pair of electrons and push the three original ones down a little bit to make this shape. A few things we need to do with this shape we have to work through. One thing involves drawing it. It's a bit difficult for me to do this sort of remotely overall and show you how to draw it. So I'm gonna to wait to explain that on the next slide. We will, however, talk about the name of it. So the name of it is tetrahedral overall. Tetra from the Greek word meaning four, and the hedra bit actually comes from the faces on the shape, not from the fact that it's got four corners. And that's very important when we come to a shape later, on the shapes later. We can see there that we have one, two, three, and then underneath there are four faces on this shape, which gives it the name tetrahedral, the name for the type of shape it is that you're meeting mathematics and do maths as well. Funny, I get to have a bit of a guessing game and say, well, go on then, we're holding it up on your whiteboard. What do you think is the bond angle for this shape? So maybe have a go at guessing that now and see how close you are. Now, generally, when we're in the class, close as we get, we are around maybe 110 degrees, someone gets around about there. The good thing is most people guess more than 90 because it's clearly above 90 and most people guess below 120 because they can't be as far up. 120 was the shape where we had three. We've now got to fit four sets of electrons on. The correct answer is actually 109.5 and that's a figure you need to remember and that's in fact exactly why I do that exercise. It's because not one of you can look at that and go oh that's about 109.5 degrees all the other shapes you can tell, like that linear one, we can see it's 180. The trigonal planar, we can see it's 120. And we'll be able to see the angles in the shapes we look at later. But this is the one that you do have to learn and remember out of all of them. It's called the tetrahedral angle. There are ways to prove it mathematically if any of you want to go and look into that. But for now, just remember 109.5 overall. OK. So then we can see the numbers in the table. Now let's add in the shape and the bond angle we've just looked at. So there it is. We can see the tetrahedral shapes we've named it. It's 109.5 degree bond angle. But I did say I'd come back to the drawing of the shape. And this is because, you know, if you're quite artistic, you might be able to draw a new shading to represent that three dimensional structure on what is a two dimensional page overall. We're not that good in chemistry overall, so we have to have a sort of symbolic way of doing it. And that's what we're going to have a look at now. I'm just going to move on and say I'm going to bring the video back on uh, now. And um, so it will cover part of the slide, but it'll help, I think, if I can show you at the same time as I'm trying to explain it. OK, so there was our model overall. So how do we do this? 
But if I kind of hold it against my hand like that, what you can hopefully see, actually it might be easier to have, given how it's oriented on your screen, which way would be the best. Let's do it that way. So what we can see is that this hydrogen atom at the top, this one pointing down uh, to this side overall, and to the left, I think it should be as you're looking at it, um, all lie flat against my hand. So we can draw those as we normally would. So we can see um, overall that there we have the carbon drawn directly upwards to that hydrogen and the carbon drawn directly downwards to there. So that's essentially those two bonds drawn exactly as they normally would be. Then what we can see is that this one points out of my hand away towards you. So that, that one there is pointing towards you overall. So how do we do that? Well, that's where we use this sort of symbol here. Essentially, it's a black triangle that gets bigger as it comes out of the page towards us. It's kind of a very rudimentary perspective overall, showing that that hydrogen and the triangle is drawn so it gets bigger as it comes towards the hydrogen, which is sticking out of the page towards you. So that's that bit there. Then we have this one here, this hydrogen here. This is pointing back towards me, so back away from my hand overall. How do we draw that? Well, that's this one here. We use a sort of dotted line that hopefully you can see there. That dotted bond shows bonds that are going into the page. The little dot is almost like it's disappearing off into the distance, so it's going away from you. So that's how we represent the bonds. Bonds that are drawn directly on the page are shown as just normal straight lines. Bonds that are coming out towards you are a solid triangle that gets bigger as it, yeah, has the, as it comes away from the central atom towards you. And bonds that are going back into the paper are drawn as dotted lines that are going away from you. And that's how we represent three dimensional shapes. And we'll need that for the next couple we come on to have a look at. So the next molecule we'll look at is phosphorus pentachloride. So you should be getting used to the idea by now. So I'm going to start off with getting you to draw the um, dot and cross diagram for this one so you can see um, where the bonding is and try and work out the total number of electron pairs, bonding pairs and lone pairs. So hopefully you should have drawn the diagram as shown here overall, phosphorus with five outer electrons and each of the five chlorines sharing one electron. And if we're counting them up, we can work our way around to a total of five pairs of electrons overall and all five involved in bonding. And you're probably spotting the sort of pattern as we're working through these. So putting those into our table now, five pairs of electrons, five bonding pairs, and no lone pairs. And now we need to consider the shape and the bond angle. So once again, have a go with your models or consider you know, what it might look like based on what we've done so far. This is a tricky one, this one, because not all the bond angles are equal. I'll give you that little clue before having a go at it. So I'll leave you to have a go and then we'll have a look and show you what the shape looks like. Right, so let's have a look at that shape then. Now to help you with this, I'm gonna go back to where we were with the trigonal planar shape, so a couple of shapes ago. And this is trying to help to explain that when we had this shape and we said we needed to now add a fourth pair of electrons, remember we talked about this space that's available at the top and the bottom. And the way that it sort of did is we kind of added a new pair of electrons at the top and the repulsion meant that each one of these kind of got pushed down a little bit and we ended up with that tetrahedral shape that we saw for the last one. What now happens if we add our new pair of electrons here, we kind of use this space at the bottom. So if I push it into there on the opposite side, and what that kind of does is push those ones back up. So they're now back in that plane around the center. So what we end up with, and it's quite tricky to do this in suites, is if we look at it from that end, we should be able to see that we've got that triangular or trigonal shape around there overall and if we look at it those three that I've just talked about are all flat or just about flat as we can see them in one plane with one sticking up at the top and one sticking down at the bottom. This gives us a shape 
that we call trigonal bipyramidal. So a slightly funny name. Now, where did that come from? Well, again, that around the middle I just pointed out is a triangular shape or trigonal, as we say it in chemistry overall. And what we can see is at the top, if we look at this one, coming down to these ones here, it forms like a little pyramid sat on the top of the molecule. And we also have a pyramid sat at the bottom. Two pyramids, so bipyramid, so trigonal bipyramidal. And that will come up there uh, to help you spell it on the next slide. Finally, while we're looking at the shape, let's consider the bond angles that are present overall. So what we have is that those three around the center are 120 degree angles, the same as they were for the trigonal planar molecule. And if we hold it that way, we can see that these ones at the top and bottom make a 90 degree angle to those around the middle. So again, we can see the bond angles for this one. As I said earlier, there are two different bond angles present. Final thing, of course, is being able to draw it. So therefore, I'm going to get you to have a go at this before we show it on the next slide. What I normally do to try and give you help is if I hold it like that in my hand, so you can see it there, maybe have a go at drawing it before moving on to the next slide overall. So there we are with our table again. And now adding in the shape and the bond angles we've looked at shown there, there's our name trigonal bipyramidal. That's the drawing of the shape. And we'll talk about that again in a second. And there we can see the 90 and the 120 degree bond angles marked. So let's have a little look at where that's coming from. So let's see where that comes from then. So let's, let's hold up the, the model again like that so we can see it. Remember how I sort of held it against my hand earlier. And what you should have been able to see from that is that this one at the top, this one at the bottom here, and this one that's pointing across uh, to the left as you look at it, um, are all flat against my hand. So if we look at the uh, drawing there, we can see that that's essentially this kind of part here, this T-shaped bit here, with the one pointing up, one pointing down, and one pointing off to the side. What we now have when we hold that is that this one here is pointing out towards you. And just as before, if I sort of draw around this, this is represented by this one here, which is the one with that black triangle showing it growing towards you. Then we can see this one pointing back away from my hand. And that's the one that's represented here by the dotted line showing the one that's pointing away from us or back into the page overall. We can then see that between those, those T-shaped ones and between those ones around the middle is that 90 degree bond angle. And between the three chlorines around the center, we have that 120 degree bond angle as we saw earlier. On to our next molecule, so our sulfur hexafluoride altogether is going to be our next one. Again, you kind of know the drill by now, dot and cross diagram, how many of the various types of pairs of electrons do we have? So there's my dot and cross diagram uh, drawn out altogether. So we can see um, on there that we have our six pairs of electrons overall. All six are making a bond to a fluorine atom, so six bonding pairs and no lone pairs of electrons present. And then we've put those figures into the table. So now what I normally get you to do is, we get used to it by now, have a go at the shape. What do you think this shape looks like? How can you get those so those electrons are spaced as far apart as they possibly can? Normally, most people do pretty well with this one, and I'll sort of hold up the shape I've made here. It's back to another nice regular shape. Essentially, if you think about it, almost as if this was a cube at the centre, and you were sticking the bonds on the six sides of the cube, so we get that perfectly regular shape, sort of like with the, the crosses as we look through it overall. So we got a nice symmetrical shape. So that's the one where we have six pairs of electrons present, and what we can see is that we have this shape. This is known as octahedral. Now, that might seem odd. Oct, you're thinking, is eight when we talked about, yeah, it's got six bonds. But if you remember back when we talked about the tetrahedral shape, the hedra bit is to do with the number of faces on the shape. And in mathematics, one, two, three, four faces around the top, and one, two, three, 
four faces around the bottom. So this shape has a total of eight faces, even though it has six bonds present. So it's known as octahedral because it's the shape of an octahedron. Uh, the bond angles, fairly straightforward for this one, are 90 degree angles. I'll show you it drawn on the next one. There's actually two ways in which people draw this. Sometimes people draw the cross flat in the paper with one pointing forward, one pointing back. But often I think it shows the symmetry better if you hold it in that sort of an angle. So you've got the two pointing out of the page towards you and two in the page. And we'll see why that is on the next slide. So there we can see, well, our numbers that we've put into the table, six, six and zero. And there is the shape drawn out. We can see the octahedral name and see what I was talking about there with the fact you've got the two floorings of the back flat triangles which are pointing towards you and the two with the dotted lines pointing away from you. But it gives that nice sort of regular shape and with 90 degree bond angles throughout. So what we've looked at there is what I like to call the five basic shapes overall. Remember when we had two pairs of electrons present, we got that linear shape at the start. Three pairs of electrons give us that trigonal planar shape. Four giving us the tetrahedral shape. Five giving us the trigonal bipyramidal shape. And six giving us the octahedral shape. And the reason I call those the five basic shapes is that the ones we're going to look at when we start introducing lone pairs in a minute are still based on one of these five basic shapes. And that's the key to understanding shapes overall is, first of all, decide the total number of electrons that are present and therefore which one of these five basic shapes does it have two, three, four, five or six pairs of electrons. Once you've done that, you can then introduce where the bonds and the lone pairs go, and that will affect the shape of the molecule overall, because the shape is normally named from just the bonding electrons. And we'll see that. I'll give an example on the next slide, which I'll work through, and then there's a couple for you to have a go at as well. So we're starting off with something called a carbene. Now this is actually an unstable intermediate in some reactions, but it's useful to demonstrate the beginning of where we're looking at with working out shapes. So the first thing to do, as normal, is we're going to have to draw our dot cross diagram. So let's have a look at that. So carbene has carbon as the central atom, and carbon, as we know, has four outer electrons because it's in group four. So just the same as we've done before, let's draw those four electrons in. Again, I've just drawn them randomly around, doesn't really matter. Each hydrogen is going to bond with one electron. So therefore we have that hydrogen bonding there and the other hydrogen forming a bond there again by sharing a pair of electrons. What that now gives us if we look at it is we have two pairs of electrons making bonds but what we're left with is two electrons left over these two here and they form into what's known as a lone pair so they still pair up but just a lone pair they're not making a bond at all what that means is we've got three pairs of electrons present so let's put that into the table shall we? so the total number of electron pairs was three but however only two were making bonds and when we do three minus two that means that one of those pairs of electrons is left as a lone pair. The key though is that top number there, three electron pairs. So which shape was it that has three electron pairs? Have a go and see if you can remember which one of the five basic shapes was it that would have three electron pairs. We'll have a look at that. Well did you get it? Hopefully you remember that the one with the three electron pairs is that trigonal planar shape, the one with the three bonds arranged in a planar shape around the middle. So what happens is these three pairs of electrons will still try and arrange themselves into that trigonal planar shape. However, this time we only have two atoms attached. So therefore I'm going to remove that marshmallow there. And we can see we've got these two representing these two hydrogens. What we remember though is this is our lone pair then, so it's still there, it's still affecting the shape, but overall there's no atom present there. So we do that to work out what the shape is, and then we actually ignore that one there when we come to name and look at the shape. 
And what we can see is that these no longer, these are not in a straight line due to the presence of the lone pair. And we end up with this shape here. This shape then is called a bent shape, or some people call it a V shape. So either bent or V shaped is the name for this. The important thing then is the bond angle as well that we need to know. If we remember, what was the angle from the trigonal planar? Can you remember that? Hopefully you remember that was 120 degrees. But the thing is that because this lone pair of electrons is not being shared between two atoms, it actually sits much closer to the central atom and therefore it has more as far as repelling the other electrons are concerned. The overall thing is that the lone pairs repel more than the bond pairs. And what this does, is it actually pushes these two a little bit towards each other. The standard rule is that it's about two and a half degrees of repulsion for each lone pair that's present. And that means that while this angle here was originally 120 degrees, this little bit of squeezing due to the extra repulsion there pushes these into about 117.5. That's 120 minus 2.5 overall. So now we just need to go and draw it overall. What you see is there's the drawing. Essentially, the easiest way to draw it is to kind of draw it as if you were trying to draw the trigonal planar shape. But one of those uh, bonds has been replaced by a lone pair. We, rep we represent the lone pair with a pair of dots, which you can see there to the bottom uh, left of the, well, uh, the carbon as you look at it. And we can see there that the name of the shape given is bent and that angle, which would have been 120 degrees had it been tri trigonal planar, has been squeezed to 117.5 degrees. So another one to have a go at. So let's let you try and work through this one, ammonia. We have NH3 there. First of all, can you draw the dot cross diagram and tell me how many electron pairs this has, how many are making bonds and how many lone pairs we have? So that's the diagram you should have come up with overall. And what we can see if we've put rings around them is we have those three bonding pairs there overall, each one of the hydrogens sharing an electron to make a bond. Nitrogen, of course, has five electrons and that leaves two which are left over as a lone pair. So a total of four pairs of electrons, three bonds and one lone pair. And so we can put those into our table. There we have four electrons, three pairs, which are bonding, and one lone pair. Remember, we're looking at that total electron pairs to work out which shape we're going to base this off. So try and think of that to start with. Which shape can you remember that has four electron pairs involved? And then maybe have a go at sort of like trying to think what it would look like and how you might draw it overall. So hopefully you remembered that our tetrahedral shape is our one with our four pairs of electrons present. But just as we saw with the previous one, we have three bonds and one lone pair. So I'm just going to remove that marshmallow from the top. And we can see there that it's still holding that sort of tetrahedral type shape because of the four pairs of electrons. But if I ignore that one from the top, this is what we're going to use to name the shape. And what they say is that these three around the bottom line a triangle. You remember the chemistry word for that? Yep, that's right, trigonal. And then it actually is no longer in a plane because this central atom is above the other three. And so therefore this is known as trigonal pyramidal, not bipyramidal. Be careful of the distinction between them overall. Of course, we now need a bond angle for this. What was the original tetrahedral angle? Can you remember that? Well then, if you remember it as 109.5, can you remember how many we need to subtract for our lone pairs of electrons? Again, well done, if you remembered it was 2.5 and 109.5 minus 2.5 gives us 107.5. Remember these are all being squeezed in just that little bit more because of the lone pair on the top. So. There's our numbers in our table. Let's put our shape in. And there we can see 
we would have drawn it as we would normally have drawn the tetrahedron. So note how they've got the other hydrogen with the bond coming towards us, the dotted bond going away from us. Essentially, it's that bond at the top that's been replaced by the lone pair when we've drawn this diagram overall. We can see the name trigonal pyramidal given there and the bond angle of 107 degrees. There's kind of a final one to come to for the ones we're going to look through today, and that's water. Remember, right back at the start of the lesson, we said, what is the shape of water and how can we work that out? So let's get you to try and work your way all the way through it. So just perhaps pause for a second, see if you can work out what it, what's the number of uh, electron pairs, how many bonding pairs, how many lone pairs. Therefore, think about what shape it would be based on put in the lone pairs and what shape you left with and what bond angle might that be. Pause here perhaps and have a good go at that and then look at the next few slides which will reveal the answer. So your dot cross diagram should look something like this, six outer electrons on the oxygen, each hydrogen bringing one electron to make a bond and what that gives us is two bonding pairs of electrons from the two hydrogens and leaves us with four electrons, which gives us two lone pairs. A total overall of four pairs of electrons, two bonds, two lone pairs. We can put those into the table. So that was four pairs of electrons, two bonds, four minus two, giving us two lone pairs. So that's got our correct amounts in there. And remember, we're going to use that top one, the number four for the electron pairs, to decide what basic shape before we try and look at it. Okay, so we're back again with the tetrahedral shape. That's the one that has the four pairs of electrons, so we need to start there. But this time we have two lone pairs, so I'm going to remove that one. And let's remove this one from down here overall. Remember, those two lone pairs are still contributing to the overall shape, but they're not actually part of how we're going to name the shape. So they're there, they're causing the repulsion effect, but overall, if I now ignore them, what we're left with is those two there that are sort of, again, in a bent shape. It's a different type of bent shape, the different bond angle, but it's still a bent shape overall. Considering the bond angle, well, the original angle was 109.5 degrees, if you remember. If you remember how much we squeeze for each lone pair, Good, if you've got 2.5, this time there are two lone pairs, so that's a squeezing of five degrees. So the bond angle here is 104.5, 109.5 minus five, giving us 104.5. In other words, the actual shape of the water molecule most closely resembled that bent one with the sort of Mickey Mouse ears that we saw at the start, that kind of shape. And that's why you'll have seen that in books. But now we should be able to prove it's that shape by working out the number of electrons present, the pairs of electrons, try and arrange them into a shape, consider the lone pairs that are present overall. Now we need to look at uh, drawing that overall. So you can see we've got our numbers in our table there. And there it is. The easier way this time is that because essentially the bent shape can lie flat in one plane, it's easy just to put the lone pairs in place of the sort of big black triangle and the dotted line we would have had in the uh, tetrahedral shape. So just showing that bent shape there again. And again, we can see the bond angle of 104.5 degrees. Okay, so today we've been trying to understand how to work out the shapes of molecules. We started the lesson by doing a bit of basic chemistry and looking at how you could come up with various different shapes for a water molecule. And then we worked through learning about all sorts of different shapes to end up with what we've just done, proving that the shape of the water molecule is a bent shape. And in fact, a number of properties of water, I, it's quite essential that we understand that particular shape um, overall. It's very important to that. So hopefully now you should be able to work out the number of electron pairs around the central atom in a molecule. Use that information to identify the shape of the molecule. We've looked at the five basic shapes, you remember, as well as looking at three where we have lone pairs present. You should be able to draw the shape using those sort of black triangle and dotted line to represent bonds in and out of the paper overall, and also name the different shapes. You need to learn, remember those names. 
and you should be able to identify the bond angles. And we looked at the fact that several of these we can do just by looking at the bond angle. Some of them, though, particularly the tetrahedral one, we need to learn overall. So as a final check for today, what I'm going to do is give you a choice of three molecules. You might want to have a go at all three. I use this in class sometimes so that I can see sort of like who's picking the most challenging one, who's perhaps feeling the most confident, and who's perhaps picking the more straightforward one, which is nothing wrong with that. It's always good to practice. It gives me an idea of where you are in the class. So you can either have a go at a basic one. I'm going to give you aluminium trichloride there. So that should be a fairly straightforward one to do. You might want to have a go at the slightly trickier PCL3, so phosphorus trichloride there, have a go at that one. Or if you fancy a challenge, I've put in an ammonium iron there. Now we haven't looked at the shapes of ions today, but this is something you have to be able to do in chemistry, is say, well, what do I know about shapes? What do I know that the charge means about an iron? And maybe put those two ideas together and come up with a shape, and that's why I've classified that as the harder one. You might want to pause here and have a go at any one or all three if you wish. I'll reveal the answers. So if you tried the aluminium trichloride one, the overall answer should have been trigonal planar overall. Essentially, you discover aluminium has three outer electrons, three chlorines bonded to it. We end up with three pairs of electrons, all making bonds and no lone pairs, which I thought this was a more basic one overall. It's fairly straightforward to draw that trigonal planar. Have a look back to the boron um, trifluoride that we looked at earlier. If you're not quite sure, you can't quite remember the shape. And it has 120 degree bond angles. If you try the slightly trickier PCL3 overall, you'll discover that phosphorus has five outer electrons being in group five. Each chlorine brings one electron, it ends up making three bonds, and it leaves a lone pair for a total of four pairs of electrons. Three uh, that are making bonds and one lone pair. And that gives us the trigonal pyramidal shape. Essentially, it's the same as the one we saw from ammonia um, a short while ago. So if you can't remember how to draw it, have a look back to the ammonia slide because it's drawn in the same way. The bond now you should therefore have should have been 107 degrees for that one. So I classify that one slightly trickier because it involved using lone pairs overall. So there's a bit more to remember. And finally, the hard one. Actually, the shape's not too tricky once you get there, but it's getting to it. And as I said, it's that idea of putting things together. What you discover is that nitrogen has five outer electrons present. Each hydrogen comes and bonds with one of those five, making four bonds overall. And that seems to leave one electron left over. But here's the key to it, because it's positively charged. Positively charged means it's lost an electron. So if we remove that electron as the one that's lost, what we're left with is now just four pairs of electrons, all of which are making four bonds. And there's actually no lone pairs present. And that, if you remember, was the tetrahedral shape and the bond angle for the tetrahedral shape, hopefully you got 109.5 degrees. Well, hopefully you've managed to follow through, learn something from that, and get a bit of a flavour of sort of like what one of the lessons might be like if you were at White College next year overall. To leave you, just a reminder that there's also the White Start booklet we produce um, for chemistry. It has a number of exercises there which are based on the work you'll have done in GCSE overall, particularly those key topics that link with things that we'll be doing at A level at WIKE to help you make that bridge. There is an exercise in there based on today's lesson as well. There are no answers for that exercise, so to try and challenge you and see what you can come up with. We ask you to hand in this booklet in your first lesson with us at WIKE. So that allows us to see how you're getting on with the chemistry uh, and how you've got on with the sort of exercise based on today and put some support in right from day one if we feel it's needed. Equally, our second lesson is always an assessment based on that work. Although you'll all hopefully have got fantastic grades in their GCSE, having learned very well this year and your teachers have predicted you some great grades, it will help because some of the chemistry you do at GCSE is very relevant to what we do at A-level and there are others not quite so much. It helps to test you on that relevant chemistry. Again, it's not a judgment of you, it's trying to allow us to put the support in from day one if we feel that you need it. 
So that's just that you know that's coming up in your second lesson with us when you start in September. OK, well, thank you for listening uh, throughout today. So from myself and from all of the White Chemistry team, um, we hope you have a great summer. Enjoy doing your White Start work and we look forward to seeing you in the autumn.